Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. So glad to be with you. Thank you for making time in your busy schedule um, to join the meeting, of course, and to do the important work of CUIC. As Jean mentioned, I am the chairperson of our anniversary task force, and the real work of the task force, or at least the culmination of that work, will not uh, manifest for another couple of years. However, during these discussions, it was decided that each task force would look at CUIC's goal, objective, uh, worthy mission of working towards racial justice among us. And so I wanted to look back, look back in time because I'm chairing the anniversary task force. Look back in time, look a little bit at what was happening around the foundation or the founding of CUIC and narrow in particularly around Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. So I've loosely titled this just because, you know, I'm a teacher in my other parts of my life and you've got to title things, right? So speaking truth to power, 60 years after MLK's letter from a Birmingham jail, I do want to point out that Churches Uniting in Christ uh, uh, had a, uh, a, a organization from which we were birthed. It is the successor organization to COCU, the Consultation on Church Union, uh, which was founded in 1962. So if we think about just the next year, in 1963, let's set the stage, particularly around racial justice in the country. So in 1963, it's almost a decade since Brown v. Board, the Supreme Court decision that uh, outlawed segregation and public education. It was a huge victory for those who believed in human and civil rights. Uh, many who were alive during that time and working in these issues say that it was almost a surprise. They they were almost surprised that the uh, the uh, the the Supreme Court, the most powerful court, the leading court of the land, would actually side with African Americans because it hadn't been very friendly to the cause of racial justice in the past. Dr. King begins his activity in 1955. He, he emerges after Rosa Parks sits down on a bus and refuses to give up her seat in December 1st, 1955. Dr. King is a young minister. He's writing his dissertation for his PhD. He says he leaves Boston University where he did his PhD coursework and he was looking for a quiet little community where he could serve a church, serve the folks in the local community and get his homework done, <laughs> write the dissertation. So he chooses Montgomery, Alabama, sleepy little town in the South. Little did he know that within a year of him being in Montgomery, Alabama, a national uh, or, or a local protest would become a national event, catapulting him to international notoriety. It's from that event that we get the Dr. King. And so he's working by 1963. He's been working almost a decade uh, along some of the issues around desegregation. Grassroots organizations have emerged in the meantime. Uh, the NAACP uh, had been around since almost the beginning of the century. Then you have other groups like CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, SCLC, uh, uh, which is a Southern Christian Leadership Conference. You've got SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, in addition to some opposing organizations like the KKK and the White Citizens Council. All of these grassroots efforts are emerging around the issue of racial justice and integration. More and more everyday people, sometimes in the study of civil rights, we call them foot soldiers. More and more everyday foot soldiers are joining the movement as local movements. Some people think that the civil rights movement was one national top-down organization, and it simply wasn't. It was basically a coalescing of local communities, local organizations and local uh, efforts in Southern states coming together, sharing strategy, resources, motivation, inspiration, and of course, with Dr. King emerging as a national leader, though he had no uh, uh, 
no authority over the local organizations. And we'll talk about that and why that's important in just a moment. And then there were victories in individual cities, individual cities like in Montgomery where the buses were desegregated. Uh, uh, other places where in Nashville, Tennessee, for example, uh, where sit-ins had begun. Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. So there were some local activities and victories, but still no national or federal legislation, which was the goal. Dr. King is widely known for the quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So lots of activity, yet when you are an activist, the proof is in the pudding. You have to get results. And there were persons who were questioning King's methods. Would nonviolence work? Because in their estimation, where were the results? It's been 10 years of Black bodies being brutalized in the streets and in local communities. And we still have no federal legislation uh, to be named. So let's talk about 1963. I often, when I'm talking to groups or students or et cetera, I often say that you think it's tough now. You think that politically we've got a tough time now. Just think about what the poor folks of 1963 were living through. 1963 was the, the, the year that I have loosely named the year that Americans must have thought the world was coming to an end. Let me give you some examples of what's happening. Remember, uh, CUIC was founded in 1962 with this lofty vision of unity and reconciliation, yet the context by which our organization was founded left very little hope for such unity and reconciliation. For example, in January of 1963, the Vietnam War is really escalating. The Viet Cong won their first major major battle on the 2nd of January in 1963. Fast forward another couple of weeks, George Wallace, the infamous governor of Alabama, is inaugurated. Uh, George Wallace had been a district judge. He also had been a sta state representative, and he had run for governor uh, the cycle before, but he was beat. He was a stereotypical FDR Democrat, if that makes any sense to you. He was running on the platform of paving the dirt roads of Alabama, providing better uh, public education and, and access to state and county facilities. Yet his opponent, who, who beat him in that, that previous race, centered his whole campaign on racial uh, 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 racial, I won't call it racial justice, but he centered his whole campaign on segregation. He uh, over and over again created fear in the hearts of Alabamians, making black people, sca scapegoating black folks as the enemy. And George Wallace lost that election. He is being, he is quoted as, as saying, and forgive my language, I'm going to use uh, some, some, um, racial language here, so a trigger alert. He is known for saying that his opponent out niggered him. And he says, he's quoted as saying, I'll never be out niggered again. So when George Wallace emerges in Alabama as the governor, his campaign in the fall of 1962, the same time our organization was being founded, is all about race. The black, uh, the black person, the N-word, over and over again. And guess what? Fear wins in the political arena. He is elected, and in his inauguration, he stands on the state, uh, the steps of the state house, and he defiantly proclaims in his inauguration address, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. That's my, my impression of George Wallace. <laughs> this introduces a new attitude of defiance. As, uh, as some people have said, if you're an African-American and you're living in Alabama in 1963, the most powerful person in your life is not the president. The most powerful person in your life is the governor. And here, the most powerful person in your life is promising you that your lot in life, your condition, your poverty, 
uh, your dehum dehumanization is not a temporary set of circumstances, but rather this is your lot in life forever. Can you imagine what these words must have sounded like to Black Americans living in Alabama in 1963? Well, we'll skip a couple months. Let's go to June. In June of 1963, we have that same George Wallace. You see him here standing defiantly. He is blocking the entrance of African-American students integrating the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Uh, he's there blocking them. And there are now recordings between that are now made public between him and President Kennedy and him asking President Kennedy to please allow some of the uh, uh, the uh, the national or the federal troops that were there supporting the students integrating. Could they at least point one of the rifles at his head so he could prove to, you know, the good old folks in Alabama that he put up a good fight? And President Kennedy is saying in these tapes, man, are you crazy? I can't have troops point a gun at the head of a sitting governor. That's a second civil war waiting to happen. But this was the context in which our organization was founded. It was later that evening, based on this standoff, that President Kennedy, sitting in the Oval Office behind that sacred desk, looks into the camera and addresses the American people. And he first introduces a call for a national civil rights bill. Now, he didn't come up with that idea. Activists, Dr. King and others had been pushing the, the Kennedy Johnson administration on such a bill, but they had been, been kept at arm's length for a number of reasons. There were other things deemed more important to the administration, more pressing than the welfare of Black folks in the South. Kennedy's had enough at this point, and he introduces the bill. Later that evening, uh, really later that night into the next morning, June 12th, 1963, Medgar Evers, who is the field secretary of the NAACP, meaning he's running the whole operations of the NAACP in the state of Mississippi. Uh, he is the king of Mississippi. Talk about Martin King now. He is the, the face, the embodiment of the civil rights movement in the state. He is coming from watching this address from the president uh, with camp with uh, staffers in his uh, in the in his office, the NAACP office there in Jackson. He leaves late into the evening, arrives home, gets out of his car in his driveway, goes to the back of his car, pops the trunk to get some T-shirts out because there's going to be a march and a rally the next day. And across the street, hiding in some shrubs and some bushes, is an assassin who shoots him with a hunting rifle. He'll, uh, later, he will die, but, but fatally wounding him in front of his wife and three young children. All of this is happening within a couple of days. Again, we've got the governor of Alabama defying uh, federal law. You've got the president calling for a civil rights bill on the federal level. And then you have Medgar Evers assassinated in cold blood in front of his family. Later in August of 1963, Dr. King is the keynote to, uh, uh, of what we now know as the March on Washington, but was originally named the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And this is where he delivers the now famed I Have a Dream speech in front of 250,000 peaceful uh, uh, citizens gathered on the Mall in D.C. Just less than a month later, just a a few weeks later, in sept on September the 15th, 1963, there is a bombing in Birmingham. It's at the 16th Street Baptist Church, and this bombing by members of the KKK uh, injured many people and, res and resulted in the death of four little girls killed in the basement of that church. This is all the same year. Keep in mind, 1963.
And then in November of 1963, here in the city in which I reside, Dallas, Texas, the president, President Kennedy, is assassinated, shot in the head, and killed uh, in November of that year. <sighs> Take a breath. You see now why I often say in 1963, in what is often thought of as the picturesque uh, civility of the 1960s where everyone is polite and we don't have the contemporary ills that we have today. How their perfect little worlds where the bubble was burst and people were beginning to see in real time that the world was maybe not as peaceful as they had once thought. However, there's an important event that happens in 1963 that I, I skipped over and I'd like to go back because it really is the, the, uh, the crust of the, or the climax of what I want to talk about today. And that is in April of 1963. Birmingham, Alabama was often named Bombingham because the, the weapon of intimidation, the weapon of choice of the Klan and others and other racist groups was dynamite, was the bomb. You see how that is enacted in September of this year. Uh, in, in 1963. And one of the reasons why that particular church, the 16th Street Baptist Church, was chosen was because it was the headquarters of the movement. Dr. King comes, he's invited by Fred Shuttlesworth, another minister and colleague of his, to come and help them desegregate downtown. In April of 1963, all of the services and the merchants and the stores, et cetera, of a downtown Birmingham would have been strictly segregated. That means if you're African-American, you can't come in the front door of most establishments. You can't try on shoes or clothes. You have to purchase them. And if they're too big or too small, you're stuck with them because the idea or the reasoning, is, I almost said logic, but it's not logical at all. But the reasoning was if you that if your black skin touched an item, it would somehow contaminate it. That no one else would want to purchase it. You would you could buy food at a restaurant, but you had to go in the the alley or the or, or the the back entrance to to grab it out of a paper sack. You couldn't sit and enjoy a meal in an establishment like other people. I could go on and on and on around the indignities of what it meant to be in a segregated Birmingham. And so Dr. King comes in. However, as no matter how inspirational we think Dr. King is now, let's not be fooled. Uh, when he died in 1968, there was a, a, a poll. You know how we love polls in this country. There was a poll that came out just a couple of months before his death, naming him the most unpopular person in America. Uh, his unfavorables were skyrocket. He was not a very popular person, not among white people and not always among other black people. So when he comes to Birmingham in 1963 and he tries to garner some support, it falls flat because the, the people are terrified. They're terrified of, uh, of, the, of the bombs, of the physical retaliation, but they're also terrified of the economic retaliation. If they were thought to participate in the march, their houses could be foreclosed upon with no course of action to rectify. Uh, they, they could be fired from their homes. Their cars could be re repossessed. Uh, on and on and on, all kinds of ways their economic, their, their, uh, are, their already unstable economic status could be threatened. So the adults would not participate. This is where we have the children. By the thousands, literally by the thousands, from Birmingham and all of the, the surrounding rural areas, children came in. I think there's some number of, of uh, upwards to 3,000 children participated in what's now known as the Children's March. And they their headquarters was at 16th Street Baptist Church. And so people in the community, it was insult to injury. It was salt in the wound that these cowards, which would, number one, choose a church knowing that it would be occupied on a Sunday morning. And it, it was almost as if, if they were uh, exacting revenge on the children because it was the children who eventually broke the back of segregation in Birmingham. 
What you see on your screen are some images. Often when you look at civil rights footages or documentaries, they'll use these footages as, as, as a general uh, depiction of what segregation or Jim Crow was like. It's important to note, the historian in me wants to know that these, the dogs and the water hoses that have become synonymous with the white resistance of the movement really only happened in Birmingham. There were other types of retaliation. Houses burned, churches burned, homes shot up, uh, people hung uh, uh, by the neck. Believe me, there were other ways to push back, but the dogs and the water hoses were pretty specific to Birmingham. While Dr. King is in Birmingham, he's arrested and he's feeling like a failure. Dr. King suffered from what we think of today as clinical depression. Most persons don't know that about him. Uh, and he often said that his time in jail, because he was always segregated and isolated from other prisoners, was always the scariest and uh, the most unsettling and the most depressing, the most difficult on his mental health. And so while he's in jail, being jailed for his activity in Birmingham, there is a group of white clergy persons who write him a letter. And in that letter, April 12th, 1963, these clergy persons write a letter and they say, to, it's an open letter published in the local paper, and they write to Dr. King saying, we the undersigned clergymen are among those in January who issued an appeal for law and order and common sense in dealing with racial problems, problems in Alabama. We expressed understanding that honest convictions in racial matters could probably be pursued in courts, but urged that decisions of those courts should in the meantime be peacefully obeyed. Since that time, there have been evidence of increased forbearance and a willingness to face facts. They go on to say, however, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens, directed and led in part by outsiders. We rec That's Dr. King they're referencing. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow and being real realized, but we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. They go on to say, uh, that they call for the local Negroes, we urge our own, no, uh, own Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. And then you can see their, their name signed. So we have members of the Episcopal Church. We have members, uh, we have at, at least one uh, rabbi, uh, Jewish rabbi from Temple Emmanuel of Birmingham. We have members of the Methodist Church, which would later become the United Methodist Church. And we have members of the Baptist and the Presbyterian Church signing this letter. Dr. King, in part, writes what now is known as Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Uh, I'm talking fast because I know our time is limited and we, we want to have some time to discuss. But I have to read you these words. 60 years uh, ago, Dr. King penned these words frightened, depressed. He began writing them in, he was, and, and angry. He was indignant at these clergy persons calling him an outsider, questioning his, his, even his right to be present in Birmingham. He begins writing in the, uh, in the margins of a newspaper. He begins continue write, writing on scraps of paper, including toilet paper. And eventually his, his uh, attorney smuggles in a, a legal pad, a notepad, and he finishes his letter uh, on that. When it's published as an open letter in the New York Times, there are persons around the country who doubt that Dr. King wrote it because it's, it's so well written. And this is before Google, this is before uh, the internet, he had no phone, he had no books, and he's quoting everyone from, from uh, church fathers and theologians to, philo to uh, philosophers throughout Western philosophy and quoting scripture, and all of it is from memory. It's quite brilliant. But allow me to read a portion of it for us, and then we'll jump into discussion. Dr. King writes, I must take two honest make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. 
I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. Whew, that'll preach right there. Who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. King goes on to say, I wish you had commended the Negro demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of the most inhumane provocation. One day the South will recognize its real heroes. They will be the James Merediths courageously and with a majestic sense of purpose facing jeering and hostile mobs and the agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of the pioneer. They will be old, oppressed, battered Negro women, symbolized in a 72-year-old woman of Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with a sense of dignity and with her people decided not to ride the segregated buses and responded to one who inquired about her tiredness with ungrammatical profundity, profundity saying, my feet is tired, but my soul is at rest. They will be young high school and college students, young ministers of the gospel, and a host of their elders, courageously and nonviolently sitting in at lunch counters and willingly going to jail for conscience sake. One day the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream and the most sacred values in our Judeo-Christian heritage. Finally, King says, several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promises. So, remember, he was called an outsider, so he's responding. He says, so I am here along with several members of my staff because we were invited here. I am here because I have basic organizational ties here. Beyond this, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Oh, can you say amen? <laughs> justice as, just as the 8th century prophets left their little villages and carried their, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his little village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco-Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So in our breakouts today, there are three questions I'd like for us to investigate together. I've told Jean that uh, there's no need for us to come back together necessarily, but I would like you to unpack this in our time remaining. Number one, I'm using quotes from Dr. King and then a question uh, based in out of the wisdom of this quote. So King's first quote I'd like for us to consider, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. What is the history of your local church and denomination in regard to justice advocacy, whether it be racial, gender, or the inclusion of LGBTQ plus persons. Because remember, a threat to justice anywhere, injustice anywhere rather, is a threat to justice everywhere. It's all interrelated. 
What work is left to do? Where are you on your journey in this work? A second question for our time together is to consider Dr. King's quote. For years now, I have heard the word wait, he says in the letter from a Birmingham jail. This wait has almost always ne meant never. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. What role, the question now, what role has the moderate played in delaying justice? And how should we respond as God's faithful? Lastly, a question for you to consider and a quote, Dr. King's quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Just the very next year, after all of these events in the world were happening, King and the civil rights movement saw their first federal legislative win. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed in the fall of 1964. So although they had worked all this time and they had seen all of these tragedies among them, still a win was just beyond their reach. What does this mean to the meaning of hope? I'm wondering today, in our times of wanting to give up, throw in the towel, thinking that it's hopeless, is a win for us and for the, the cause of justice and peace? Maybe it's just beyond our reach if we hold on a bit longer. What does this say to the meaning of hope among us in the fight for peace and justice?